welcome everybody. Of course, they're like a small, small team tonight, but I'm very happy today. Not tonight, actually, in the morning in the US, like evening in Hong Kong. <laughs> happy to see you all again. And um, so today we're going to talk about Daniel Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. It seems maybe a challenging book because we are not too many and maybe <laughs> many people are afraid maybe talking about it. I'm not sure. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it, actually. I think most of us, we are all busy with uh, the end of the semester, I can imagine. And um, so we wanted actually like to, we're going to lead, Sam and I, we're going to lead the discussion. But I can imagine because we are like a small group today, so that we're all going to carry the discussion together. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that for the exchange. Maybe um, general, uh, we wanted first like to have like a little... A little overview wanted to go over like the main topics in the in the book not that we're going to say we're going to talk for hours about it but maybe five minutes just to say a couple of things about system one and two um, and then we wanted actually to discuss actually some biases actually so some heuristics a little bit about the broad theme and in the end, we wanted to talk a little bit about um, the applications, how we apply these uh, parts of bias and heuristics, maybe in our own teaching, our own personal life or professional life. And we wanted also to point out that we have two sessions on the book. And so we're going to have enough time actually to talk today and the next time about the book because it's a very thick book. So that's something to point out. Sam, is there anything you would like to add at the beginning now before we jump into? Oh, I just lost the ability to hear you. Is that me or? Did... Ah, that was me actually. Oh, that was okay. me. Okay. I always have this little button right here to, to click on different things. Okay. Um, Are you doing some uh, system one multitasking over there? <laughs> I can imagine so. I'm just like very, Maybe unconsciously I'm using system <laughs> ones. Um, okay, I want to also like to point out like when uh, Samantha and I, we prepared like today's session, we're not psychologists or economists and uh, Daniel Kahneman, he's diving into that kind of uh, topic a lot. So we are not, we don't see our, ourselves as experts in the field, but that's what we wanted to, but we're hoping for like a rich uh, discussion here. And um, because like the book is very rich and very dense and, and there's also like a whole vocabulary actually to, to, to learn our concepts. And I think like Sam and I, we did not learn all the heuristics and biases mentioned in the book. So it's really a discussion. Mm. Sam? Yeah, so um, I think, so the reading that we did um, goes into system one, and I don't think we quite got into system two. So basically the, um, the heur heuristics that we're discussing today are all those um, like immediate decision, reactionary, not well thought out, just kind of um, mechanical decisions. So um, what we like to do today, um, it's a small group, so we could actually just discuss it all together if you guys want, or we can do the breakout um, and do like a group of three and a group of two. But what we'd like to do today is um, we provided this uh, kind of summary sheet of um, the first set of heuristics covered in chapters one through 22. So we wanna do something a little bit fun. And um, where's my link here? So I'm gonna put a link in the chat room, two links actually. The first link is going to be to our um, heuristics cheat sheet that we're all gonna to reference together. And let me navigate Zoom, sorry. Chat window, okay, so in the chat window, this first link that I'm putting is to our cheat sheet that we can all reference together so we're all on the same page. Um, and when you open it up, you'll see that there, all of the heuristics are numbered and bookmarked according to this summary that um, this guy, Eric Johnson, put together about the book. I don't know Eric Johnson. I just found this, <laughs> this summary of all the heuristics online. So I, hopefully they're fairly accurate, but we can kind of um, assess that as we um, take a look at some of the heuristics. 
Um, but the second link that I want to share with you is actually to a number randomizer or like a, a random number generator. And this is a fun way for us to, because there's so many heuristics, we can't possibly talk about all of them today. So listed here are 22, right? So we can use this fun um, number, random number generator to kind of like randomly decide on um, a heuristic to talk about. Or we can just um, kind of, someone can volunteer something or a heuristic that they think is particularly inter interesting or particularly like applies to their life or, or work. So however you guys want to do it. Any thoughts? I, again, I didn't read the book, so I'm eager to hear about it. I'm waiting for like two months already in the audio book to get it from the library. <laughs> Um, so as I look over it, the narrative fallacy, that sounds very intriguing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would be narrative fallacy. And I don't know if one of you want, I can also share the screen. So like we can look at like the Google doc or, um, for everybody who's watching the, the video as well. That might be good. Actually, that's yeah. a good idea. Um, so, um, yeah, so why don't, unless, unless someone else is kind of dying to discuss a heuristic first, um, why don't we just all talk together? There's only five of us and I think we could yeah. all benefit. Also, like if, right? if you have like general comments about the book, um, so let's share them, you see, so that's something, um, I'm not sure if Tamsi or Sam or Pam, if you want to share something, Yanti, you said you have not time you had not no time to read it so far what are your what were your first reactions maybe did you like the book was it interesting sam did you like it um yeah so i haven't read all of the first chapter or the first 22 chapters that were assigned um and what i have read warrants like going back and rereading a couple of times actually but what struck me is that um, a lot of the things, like this is so relevant to our current media and, and like um, how, how people are kind of digesting media and thinking about media um, and information these days. So I was actually really excited to read that there's a pretty comprehensive list of the way that we are um, kind of in a reactionary way thinking about information and content right now. So that was really exciting to me. Um, and like a lot of these heuristics and biases are, are ones that I'd like to incorporate in my classes and teaching. So um, the one that actually, where's my notes? The one that actually spoke to me most was um, the halo effect. Um, that one was pretty, um, I, I just actually read um, The Press Effect by Kathleen Hall Jamison and Paul Waldman. And it goes really <coughs> To, um, uh, has anyone read that? The press no. effect. Okay, so if I oh hi Tamsin, I like your hat. <laughs> um, the um, the press effect goes into really analyzing the the media coverage around the 2000 U.S. election between um, they mostly focused on Gore and Bush, and they really talk about how journalists tended to characterize and paint the presidential candidates based on their initial impressions of each one, which is totally halo effect. Um, and the authors of that book actually go into a little bit of like the psychology and the dangers of like journalists acting as psychologists because the way they sort of painted um, these candidates based on this halo effect thinking, um, it, it's just kind of like, you know, textbook thinking fast and slow. Like, you know, they were really painting those people um, that halo color. So um, that wasn't a, a terribly articulate um, description. Yonti, can you? But <laughs> yeah. But about the halo effect to be on the same page, Yonti, can you share like the, the link or like the page with the halo effect? Maybe in the, in the Google document? I think there should be like a link to the halo effect. It's heuristic five. Ah, okay. Um, because sometimes I think for some, I think it's very difficult actually like to, because it's so rich, you see. Mm. Um, to put it in the chat? Or maybe if you want to share like the, 
You can put it in the chat or share your your screen. I'll put it in the chat. So that will be. Because for me, like the hello effect was also something very interesting. So in the world, I'm not sure if this is the right definition, you see. But for me, the hello effect was really like something when you, for example, you're, you like somebody a lot. Basically, that person can say anything he or she wants and you take it as something for granted and you accept actually their, their arguments. So basically, like your thinking is a bit, yeah, because of this hello effect kind of limited, if this is correct. Do I agree? Do you agree with that? Yeah, so? that's, that's basically, so yeah. And so what I was describing is like in that, in that um, election cycle, George Bush was kind of, he kind of came out and started to be thought of as like a very charming, charismatic guy, right? And so because mm. journalists had that idea of him as a person, as charismatic or as stupid, like that was another one, like they had this initial impression of him as being not intelligent. And so everything that they covered about him followed that same narrative because that was the initial impression of him or the same with Gore being a liar. Like Gore was kind of positioned actually by the other um, um, political uh, campaign as being a liar. And so because that was the initial impression to the press, he was portrayed as a liar throughout the campaign. So same, but like negative examples of the lovely one you gave. <laughs> yeah, but that's like a nice, uh, nice, okay. that's, that's a good example. So I'm not sure, Pam, did you, did you have time to look into the book? Did you have you know, um, I got the audio version because I was uh, driving to New York, um, not this just past weekend, but the one before and thought I'd have a lot of time to listen to it. And I ended up taking the train most of the way. And mm -hmm. last week was my um, big birthday week. So I did, did I only got to about um, chapter five or six, I think. And it was pretty frustrating because of all the little you know activities that he has you do that would be a whole lot easier if you're sitting there with a pen and pencil or looking at the thing the examples in the book um, rather than driving a car um, so I jumped on today because it was enough to grab my attention to want to hear more about what other people thought but my um, contributions will be limited. But that halo effect, you know, it's definitely in um, full swing when it comes to Trump supporters. Uh, apparently there is nothing he can do wrong for his um, MAGA followers. Yeah, that sounds, sounds very true, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. So happy birthday, you? Sam. Thank you. <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so Tamsin, not to put you on the spot, but um, actually Tamsin told me about this book over a year ago, and um, I think she read it last summer. So I would love to hear uh, your thoughts on it. So I read it at least three years ago, and I read it cover to cover, and it totally changed everything about how I see the world. Um, <laughs> uh, but it has been three years, which is sort of the problem here. Um, it changed in, like, it it, it was a catalyst for a paradigm shift for me in terms of how I operate, um, even in my daily life, because um, taken on the whole, going through each one of these heuristics, um, it, it taught me, it actually, it, it gave me so much evidence about my own brain and about my meaning making machine that's up here and how much of a monkey I really am um, that uh, I, I felt actually empowered by it to no longer succumb to probably on a daily basis any number of the cognitive errors that he, you know, he brings to light. Um, maybe one of the biggest pair, uh, shifts for me from this book was um, related to, uh, well, well, intuition, right? Um, it was that as a child and then growing up and as a teenager, I, I started, to, I know it was Malcolm Gladwell's fault. So for a long <laughs> while, I used to believe that we should follow our gut um, pretty, pretty, 
uh, conscientiously and, and become in tune with ourselves and whatever that feeling was that we should follow it. And um, I operated from that vantage point until I read this book. And um, this book helped me separate out what intuition is and and what what we believe about intuition from how our brains actually just function and i am such a fan of empirical evidence and i'm a fan of science so give me all the logic and i will eat it right up um but uh like i would go to bars and like talk to dudes about this book <laughs> i love it so much problem is now it's been years and now it's just incorporated into who I am. The thing, so I, I do highly encourage everybody to read it to the end because I think that it is important um, to take uh, for, for all that it is. Um, but I, I guess from this blathering uh, of mine, um, a question that maybe I can throw out to the group then is about the, sh the ways that we perceive the world. There are, there are various paradigms, one of them being follow your gut, listen to that and, and proceed to make decisions based on that. And then there is the Kahneman school of thought. And I'm wondering if that is changing or has changed where because of him and his work and the work that he did not do alone, I've actually read the follow-up book to this. It's not really follow-up, but it's a book about um, Kahneman and um, Amos Tversky, the other genius um, who, who he worked with for so many years. Um, I'm wondering if this, ha if it's starting to become part of the zeitgeist um, and if in educational institutions or even in in any of our realms that we are, um, that we inhabit, are we starting, is this a normal way to approach things now? Is it becoming more normal to think about cognitive biases, et cetera? Is anybody noticing a shift or a change? Mm, I think that's, for me, it's a very interesting question that you're asking. Um, I think um, I didn't thought of, I didn't, did not think really like about uh, cognitive bias before, <laughs> because okay. I was a happy person. I was a happy person. <laughs> right now, I'm even happier, probably because I know a bit more. So I feel a bit more under control because I have to think that maybe I understand better a couple of things, understand better how I maybe think. I've. Um, What's interesting for me is I heard about the book um, a year ago from a colleague. She comes out of the science department. And for me, it seems like uh, this is not a coincidence. I think for somebody who's coming out of statistics, the book is very interesting because she's also like a first year professor or she's teaching first year students. And so she wanted actually like students to learn about like the system two and to think about like system one. Um, so in a way I hear about it, um, also um, here in Paris, like I have like a, another colleague, or like actually a friend, she bought the French version of the book. So that's also something very nice, but she's also again like more like a scientific spirit. And you see my own bias is actually I'm more like a non-statistics person. So for me, it was very interesting also to think about my own bias with regard to the book, what I like and what I do not like, what I refuse or not. Um, and then, of course, I was thinking also like in terms of my teaching of information literacy, um, because we want to teach students actually to kind of an openness to information and think about it, you see. And sometimes if you have like, let's say a confirmation bias or like a bias not to listen to other person or people, then actually you're closing yourself out and you stay in your echo chamber. Well, yeah. And um, so I thought it was very interesting to see like these little, these little, um, yeah, heuristics or biases, you see. So for me, it was very interesting. And I believe that um, I hear about the book, but I'm not sure 
to what extent it's actually increasing because it was written already in 2011. Okay. And so it's not, I, I don't know. I can so this is just like my anecdotal feedback from for my for my little world. So it's gonna be sure. I guess I asked that because I th I feel like his ideas and the ideas that are yes that were that that were made public in this book in a wide way are spreading and are spreading because of social media at least within certain groups. And I just wonder if it's gotten as far as into into, into education um, in, in educational institutions, if, if teachers are are incorporating it into curriculum into the curriculum at all at this point. But I feel like now, as I wander this earth and I meet people in different countries, somebody will mention a like one of the heuristics or will mention something that. Um, he 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 played such a massive role in popularizing. So that's yeah. I guess why I'm wondering if it's just starting to proliferate. Um, and I think it is because I think that's why you know there have been other books now written about him. Um, mm. That was Michael Lewis's book that I'm referring to um, mm. that came out recently. And that's maybe what Samantha was thinking about that I just read within the past year. Mm -hmm. So but, Tim, no. are you talking about uh, within the academic community or within yeah. the world at large? Well, well, both. I'm interested in both because I'm not in the academic community, but I would, so I imagine if any of you are, <laughs> then I can pose that to, to you. But I would, I, I would hope that it, that, that the ideas are spreading or are being talked about. And I don't know if it's in any formalized way yet. Mm -hmm. Or, or if it's just starting to become part of our yeah. social discourse in a way that it's almost seamless. And I have, I partially think that it actually is, that there are ideas that we don't know that actually came from his research and his studies that we are applying now and not knowing that it was him who did the ground, or laid the groundwork for it. That's yeah. That's anyway, possible. That's it's, a, yeah. One thing that I'm curious about. For me, I, I have to think that this discussion comes right now into the information literacy debate a little bit. There was like a very yeah. interesting article, like um, six months ago, I think, or a couple of months ago. It's how to teach information literacy in, a, in an age of lies, and they actually in that uh, short article. Um, it's talking actually about uh, bias, how we approach things uh, with our own bias with regard to. So I have the feeling that, and they talk about confirmation bias, they talk about cognitive ease, they're talking about two or three, and they are overlapping actually like with Kahneman's book. So I believe there's like this kind of, and also like the effect, like what I mentioned of the echo chamber, so that this is kind of, people are not listening to the outside, but they just stay within their, their bubble. So I believe that there is, yeah, with also like the, the fact of the, the fake news and the alternative facts that there is this kind of movement coming up. You know, I want to well, point out that, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. So you mentioned, Michael, in, so the, in the world of information literacy, you guys are addressing cognitive easing, right? And I've noticed the same in news literacy and media literacy, that there's there is a lot of talk around that one particular bias and but i don't often hear and actually at hku we teach cognitive bias as part of our news literacy program but i don't actually see a lot of programs focusing on any of these other heuristics or biases so i think that's kind of interesting i wonder if that it could be because maybe it's it's connected to such a um I don't know, emotionally comforting kind of effect? Or yeah, is it is it easier to understand than some of the others? Like, why do you guys think that could be? Because actually, pretty much all of them that I have read, I'm like, oh, this applies to information in this way. This applies to information in this way. This applies to how I'm thinking about information. Like, they all are, re are relative, but it seems as only just that one is being actually applied mainstream. 
Sorry, can you repeat, which is the one that you're saying it, you are seeing? Which cognitive, one? Cognitive bias. Like uh, cognitive easing, cognitive easing. Which one is, remind me what that means. So it's basically the idea that um, our brains are wired to make us feel better about things. Okay. So, yeah. So um, I don't know if I can describe it as well. Oh, can we consult the list? <laughs> Maybe yeah, for a better. <laughs> If I jump in, like the cognitive ease would be to make things easier because in a way, when you think about system one and system two, so you have system one is something like very, like uh, system one's intuitive, something like uh, fast thinking uh, and easy. And the system two is more lazy and you would have to actually like to make an effort. So the tendency or like the argument right here is to say that cognitive ease happens because actually you, you like system one is actually more our way we, we think, you see. And um, so to make things more easier because it's more pleasing to us. If I understood it correctly. Okay. And so is that's what Samantha is saying? That principle um, is something that is being talked about in school in, or at least in her program? Mm. You know, am I muted? Okay, no. Oh, there. no. Okay, so now that I'm thinking more about it, like what we talk about is cognitive dissonance. Ah, oh, okay. And the cognitive bias that comes along with that. And I, I think I maybe confuse the two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's so much in that book and you guys are talking about it at the very beginning of the book, which I read a long time ago. <laughs> Yeah, Hi. and I, it's. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, well, you know, everybody wants to talk about why did Trump get elected, and if you are somebody who reads a lot, there's plenty of great analysis out there on that. But for every second person who I meet who still is out, you know, when you're not in America, because of course some of us in this group are not um i i'm finding people are still baffled by it but i feel like if you just look at what kahneman says he'll explain it all um and i feel like you can apply the, a lot um what this book sort of explains human nature in, in really important and relevant ways so when Basically, these days, whenever somebody says, why was that decision made? Like, why did somebody do that? I'm just like, ah, oh, just rethinking past and slow, because it'll explain it to you. Um, so the, I think that uh, there was a whole, I mean, that obviously, I'm, I'm, not, I'm thinking mostly just in terms of this small portion of the population that decided to vote for him um, for their reasons and not all that other crazy stuff that, that also <laughs> may have contributed all the um, meddling, etc. But, uh, you know, why that this is the importance of this book is understanding what otherwise seems like baffling human behavior. Um, and each one of these heuristics gives another insight into why we do what we do and in a way I think that takes away um I uh, okay let's see how I can articulate this I think that reading this book is valuable because once you have all of it um uh, once you once you absorb all of it um I don't think that we can as easily judge one another for what otherwise might look to the casual observer like ridiculous behavior. Because our brains um, function in what seem to be mysterious ways, but Kahneman starts to really make sense of, of it. I think that's why he won you know, the Pulitzer for it. Or the Nobel. What was it? No, I have the freaking book. The Nobel or the Pulitzer? It was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was 
many prizes. No, um, Nobel prize. the Nobel? At least Nobel. <laughs> At least. Thank you. Sorry. I've been hanging out with some journalists and I'm at my seat. I'll let it turn on the brain. You know, rather than what was the first thing in my mind, it, you know, there's stay. a heuristic for that. But stay, stay, stay away from the journalists. So it's okay. <laughs> well, Tamsin <laughs> is a journalist. <laughs> well, I think what's uh, uh, what's coming. Some jerk who won a Pulitzer just last night, so that's why that was in my mind. Um, what's, coming, what's, uh, what's coming up for me as I hear Tamsin t uh, talk about this and her asking about how mainstreamed the, these ideas have become is yeah. that's why I wanted to tune into this to find out what is the relevance to media literacy and how can we use it um, in our practice to really help people recognize these uh, brain functions. And I don't know if things have changed in the internet uh, age, but I can remember being so frustrated when I was in my undergraduate um, degree work, which is, uh, you know, admittedly decades ago now, but that I was told there's a 20 year gap between research and practice. So, you know, and it was frustrating to think, God, I'm learning about all these great new child development, you know, th things. Why aren't people doing this? And a professor said, you know, this is the norm. There's a 20 year gap. I'd like to think that that gap isn't quite so um, long now, but I guess that's what's really um, interesting to me is how do you get this information into a way that can be um, digested easily, understood easily, learned easily to make real changes. I Does think that, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really pragmatic. And I, I, that's something I would like to be sorted out as well because I would love to see people learning from this book and maybe that's why we have a small crowd on top of the fact that it is the date that it is because it's it's it is a dense read until you commit yourself to it but I I mean so it I I I think that it is starting to have I mean I've already said this yeah, that I think that it is penetrating, but I don't know who or how um, that's being done, you know, because we need it to be in more bite-sized morsels, because, uh, um, yeah. Actually, I would like to, to, to start using the book actually for my teaching and use like these uh, kind of the book, but I, I won't give like the whole book to read to the students, of course, because they're going to they're going to die. <laughs> yeah. uh, so well, I was saying what if that... though, like really just what needs to be extracted in my view are like uh, the name of the heuristic uh, or the error that's being made, um, a very quick, easy ex um, definition of it, and then a concrete example. Because for me, what I remember, like, three years later, even though I know that my brain has changed because it, because of reading it, um, I don't remember most of the specifics, but for example, one that I tend to tell people about all the time that really stuck with me was the record scratch example. Now, I don't know where in the book, that could be later on. Do, do, does that ring a bell for any of you if I just say record scratch? You can say no can and then the, I'll- Can we see the document? So I don't even, so the record scratch example is about how um, when you have a, an experience of some kind, it de depending on how that experience ends is how people remember it. And the, there was a, the study that allowed him to, to come to this insight was that he had a whole bunch of people um, listen to on a classical music record, uh, you know, old school record, beautiful 40 minutes of this record. It is just beautiful music. People are listening in their headphones. It sounds amazing. And everybody's having a jolly good time until two minutes before the record's supposed to end, 
they purposefully have this awful screech like the the needle has scratched across the record now then after the, this experience um they ask people to rate how they felt um about their experience of listening to this music and those who didn't have a record scratch or were rating it you know as they went through were rating like I'm so happy, I feel good, I love this music. But those who heard this record screech, this horrible, god-awful noise at the very end, um, when they were asked about their entire experience, all they could remember was what happened at the end, and it was something bad, and therefore they rated the, even though 40 minutes out of like 45 minutes were bliss, they rated it the whole experience as being not so great. So I take this example with me in my life and if I'm out with friends or if I go home to be with my parents in Canada and, uh, and we get into a big fight, like I make sure to not allow the end of the experience to be bad no matter what, I make sure to somehow right a wrong or ensure there is no wrong to be in what, so, so the point being that if we're talking about how can we um, incorporate this into education um, in a much more clear and concise way than I explained it, because again, I did not practice for this session. I haven't read it. I've forgotten. But if you have these concrete examples, and, and um, I think then suddenly people can understand them and then start applying them and see how they apply in their own lives and I do believe that he does this throughout the book he will give lots of concrete examples so it's just about distilling um you know skimming the cream off the top um and then and then you can dole it out I think um for students to go oh okay what's a heuristic here's the example what's an example for my life? I mean, it's, I don't think it's actually that hard. You just need somebody to go ahead and do it. <laughs> so that's her heuristic number 41 from chapter Thanks. 45, by the way. <laughs> it's called Ignoring <laughs> Our Two Selves, where we have the experience of um, like experiencing ourself in our present and then remembering ourself. Aha, uh -huh. yes. And I think they talk, <laughs> and they apply it also to surgery and painful experiences. Where if the whole surge, like if, it, yeah, there's there's a whole chapter on pain and how we remember that pain. And if there's if the pain's at the very end, then like the worst thing in the world. But it, I can't quite yeah. see. I, I'm not remembering. But it's the concrete examples that we need. And if we had all read this properly together, we'd be doing a little better on this discussion. <laughs> No, for, for me, it's very helpful. You see, also like seeing that it's number 41, you see, so <laughs> that's something. So there's really a lot, you see, and I can imagine that beyond that list that we have in that book, there might be even like other ones. So there's no limit to the whole thing that like these kind of biases or heuristics playing tricks on us. But then you see, I was thinking about not only about choosing which actually of these biases I might actually look at, but also like maybe... Um, are there, what is the predisposition of the students actually, or how, what would be very efficient actually, or work well, you see, with the students, you see, because if I'm gonna say, look, for example, at the confirmation bias, and students just wanna actually confirm their own research question and their thesis statement, mm. in a way, so there might be some misleading things, so I'm gonna challenge actually, like their assumptions, and sometimes that might not be that easy actually so and it needs so that was actually my a thought that i had like when i was reading reading and i i think like sam you mentioned it that you also tried like a bit of teaching of bias in the past is that correct yeah so um we do teach about cognitive bias which again is different <laughs> than um the cognitive ease ease um here but um we kind of, so the, the curriculum that we teach is, is a bit different than like what I would like for it to look like. So I, it's not really in my control, but I think that we should be spending more time on, like we do kind of talk about like bias and, you know, how um, 
people have an impression of media that media is biased and why that could be and whether or not it's accurate or, you know, like some of the factors that can contribute to bias. But for the most part, we just kind of say, like, we kind of make a blanket statement that, you know, you can't call media bias. In order to find bias, you have to find examples and a pattern of, of bias over time. So we kind of address it on like a very, very pinpoint content level, but we don't actually get into any of these, like, even though we explain that a little bit, overwhelmingly in essays that I get back from students about things, all, all things news, every single essay I get, um, they all attribute things to bias that don't even have anything to do with bias. So there's a really, like bias is such a buzzword right now. And it's so easy to kind of like, think you understand what it means and start seeing it when it doesn't exist, that it's kind of becoming dangerous because we're not actually teaching them what it is. We're teaching them like a surface level idea that is kind of being weaponized. So it's, yeah, it's kind of frustrating to see that, like, I'll ask, you know, we'll, we'll, um, we'll ask them about, uh, perfect example. We just did find, I just graded final exams last week. And one of the essay questions was, um, name three reasons why the verification process that a journalist goes through might fail. And we teach them things like, sometimes the reporter doesn't have time to fully verify something. Sometimes a source might lie when verifying information, you know, things like that, like very practical reasons um, that involve the journalist's best effort, right? Overwhelmingly, they cited bias as one of the reasons. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, we don't talk about that at all. So, and even in um, uh, projects, they get to choose their topic for projects and they all wanted to do bias. And I'm like, I seriously recommend that you don't do that because I don't think you really understand it well enough to do a project on it, so. Mm. And is it because it's a buzzword that's out there now that they're all interesting? Like it's got some pop culture flair? What, 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 is, what do you think is the reason that they're all so keen? I think that's part of it, but I think that like there's such a um, there's such a cynicism around journalism right now and news media right now that it becomes easy for them to spot bias where it doesn't exist. They it's easy like I think they're looking to explain media climate right now. And to be frank in this conversation, I don't think we're actually doing a good job in the curriculum that we have. Um, in actually helping them make sense of what they're seeing in the news landscape. So what they're doing in absence of true understanding is they're, they're applying bias. And which system, A or B, would that be? That would totally <laughs> be system one. <laughs> so there we go. But yep. that's really sad. Also. It is, it's frustrating. But, yeah, frustrating. We like just had a yeah. session with um, Brazilian journalists that were brought here uh, through the State Department with the Media Education Lab in Providence. And Renee had a part of her presentation that was um, all the words you can use instead of fake news. I mean, it, she was just really trying to get people away from even using that term because it's become so loaded. Yeah. Hmm. I think it's the same phenomenon because it's, it's kind of the same, like the easy go-to is bias yeah. or fake news because it's, it's not really clear what those things mean. It's sort of almost a feeling now, you know? Yeah. Rather so than they're a, both system one, system two, kind of, you know, that at work there. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, system one is the easy and we're trying to do the, get them to do a little harder work. Yeah. Do you guys think that's a futile effort? <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> I, I worry that like, you know, we definitely, yeah. especially like literacy is all about system two thinking, right? And so, yes. Well, do you need to get everybody though? Or should you just focus on those who actually do care and are trying? Like you know, in, in the end, democracy, I everybody's vote counts, right? So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh that's if you think about information in that way, like that's I think it's really true. important for everyone to be it thinking like about things. It. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess. Oh, see, I'm being cynical. 
what's interesting is that again not knowing totally what you're talking about <laughs> and just trying to assume what i've heard about the book and and stuff like that and talking with the application for education it's really connecting um all what you're talking about to universal design for learning and that's how i make like the connection because it's so first of all the last discussion are we going only for the engaged one or are we reaching everybody so universal design for learning is trying to go to everybody by engaging and saying first of all you need to engage in whatever way and then you use different representation different way of them to express so you would switch for different systems and you allow differentiated instruction so you as the instructor need to work much harder but to allow everybody to process the information that you're giving to them. So Samantha, don't be discouraged. Uh, it's just uh, uh, something about engagement and then having them express the way that it will work for them to express what they actually understand. So you can evaluate in different ways what they actually process and understand because maybe written is not their forte and they'll be better in producing a video about it uh, and they'll do much harder work but they'll be able to express. So it sounds like it's very connecting to that. Unfortunately, I see it only used in several special education classes and not more wide, like college, hardly. When I'm talking with instructor in college, they're like, what are you talking about? Like, so I don't know if it resonates with any of you, but it sounds like it's the application of what you're talking about would be like universal design for learning. Well, I, I really liked uh, Tamsin's idea about making those concrete examples, too. And, and I, it's making me really want to go and finish the book. Thank you, Tam. And, um, and look at that and try and think if I can think of them in my own life. When you were talking about the, the record um, thing, like I immediately thought of the opposite, which is childbirth. I mean... You ask most parents, mm -hmm. you know, what they remember about their childbirth experience, and it is not, like, I couldn't believe when I read in the books I was reading before I gave birth that most mothers immediately forget that pain they go through. It's like, what? You know? And in the middle of it, it's like, there is no way I'm forgetting this. <laughs> And then the end result is this baby, this miracle, and you do, you forget it. So it's because a great opposite example that, you know, a whole yeah. lot of people can relate to. Absolutely. <laughs> I love that. That's so, so perfect. You know, when, we were, when you were talking about that before, Tamsin, I was wondering if there's an example of the opposite, like Pam, what you're saying, <laughs> like, what if you had a really bad vacation and the last day was good? Would you still remember it as good? Probably not, <laughs> but that's a really good example. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I'm, thinking no about, here. <laughs> I'm thinking about my students. It's not the same, but, um, you know, they are suffering from writing like a, paper the whole semester but then eventually after i'm like re-editing working with them and they have a really nice professional paper so that will be interesting to check if that's really their experience at the end so they suffer they complain the whole semester about it but if the end result look impressive and they can share it if it will be remaining as like a positive experience hmm. That's another great example. I do mm. believe that you, we, there is a general sense out there that usually when you do suffer through something but then come to a successful result that people feel like they really made it, made it happen and it is positive overall. So, and that's probably another one of those heuristics. I just don't remember which one. <laughs> System one again. <laughs> cool. So Michael and I are doing this project that um, that we're kind of incorporating a lot of the things that we learned at the Digital Institute last summer, including some of this like um, giving students a choice in their own learning process. And like we're doing like um, uh, like the screencasting and instead of having them write essays and stuff. So it'll be interesting to see if that actually empowers them to learn in the way that you're talking about, Yancy. So mm -hmm. we'll have to circle back to that like in yeah, six months <laughs> do. that's part of the research that i'm doing now to really see the effects of it so yeah 
super interesting. Oh, well, we have two minutes left. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we should wrap up, even though this has been like a really, really great conversation. I'm sad that it's... <laughs> I have, a question for, I have a question for Yanti, as you have not read the book, actually. So was that discussion helpful for you? Was there something? Yeah, so what's interesting is that um, I still have no idea what is system one or A and system two. I have some assumption according to what you're saying. So it's interesting for me. And I'm, I guess it's going to take more than a month until I'll get like to the up in the waiting list to read the book or to hear the book. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Which is a good sign. A lot yeah. of people are reading it. Oh, yeah. yeah good oh, point. hearing it. Uh, hearing it. <laughs> I think yeah. it's him yeah. that reads it, too, who, who narrates. Because it's very scholarly and very uh, professor-like. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there were times when I'm driving in the car and listening to it, mm -hmm. especially being asked to add three numbers to a list of numbers. I'm like, there's no way I'm doing this and driving. Yeah. <laughs> but it, you know, it just, it felt like I was in a classroom a lot of the time. And I, th I think it's him. I don't know. I'll have to look. Interesting. Yeah, so that's, I mean, again, and trying to, like, understand, like, but I understand that it's, it's, it's more than just philosophy and economics, but it goes to education and it goes to our daily life decisions. So I think, you know, sounds like a fascinating book. For sure. And that's the reason why we have a second session. So that's going to be nice. So <laughs> when is when is it going to be like Sam? Do you know or Yanti? It's um, I'm going to uh, stop the recording and then we can like talk okay. about it.